Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Andrews. Uh, whether you're joining us here in person or online, we just want to say welcome. And this morning, before we begin a time of worship, you know, I just wanted to, to remind everybody, we come from all of these different places when we come here to worship, whether, you know, we're in home just barely making it in time to jump on to be able to see the live stream or you have to watch it later or you just, you know, barely made it in here to church or maybe you're having a great morning. You know, we, we come into contact with all of these different messages from the world and all of these different pressures that come into our mind and into our life. And, you know, right now it seems like there's a lot. And so just being able to come in here together to worship and remember who we really are. You know, the world likes to tell us we're a product of our society or we're, you know, the, the product of our environment, you know, whatever it is. But that's not who God says we are. So let's remember that the truth is that we're children of God. And as we sing this next song, let's just let that serve as a reminder to us that no matter what we're facing, that we are God's children and he is right there beside us. So let's pray this morning. Father, we love you and we thank you so much for that truth. And I pray that we would just let that settle into our hearts and our minds just to be reminded that we are your children. In your name, amen. All right, well, why don't you stand and join with us as we begin. I can see the promised land Though there's pain within the plan There is victory in the end your love is my battle cry when my fears like jericho build their walls around my soul when my heart is overthrown your love is my battle cry the anthem for all my life see every giant will fall every giant Mountains will move, every chain of the past is broken into over fear over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible with you. Whoa. There's hope within the fight. Some promise that we have, right? That we have the one who is stronger than us beside us, no matter what we're facing. So, Father, we thank you for that. In your name, amen. Well, you may be seated this morning as we continue. 
Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all here. I mean, that song got me revved up. I'm ready to worship today, aren't you all? Yeah. So fantastic. Uh, we want to greet everybody. I'm Reverend Gary Rideout, one of the co-senior pastors here at St. Andrews with my wife, Jane, the other co-senior pastor. We're glad that you're here. We want to um, uh, just, you know, if you're on the chat space, if you're out in the live stream, just uh, put a message in the chat space to welcome everybody, say hello to everybody. Here in the sanctuary, just kind of waved everybody around here to greet them. There you go. So one of these days we'll be able to greet in person. But I wanted to let you know about a few announcements that we have. First of all, and this is particularly for people here, is um, in order for us to have these services, we have a good crew of people that uh, sanitize the, surface, the, the, the services after each one. And we, we need some more help with this, especially after this service. And it really only takes, they got it down to an art, these people too. They, 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 it's, it only takes 10 minutes to do, but we could really use your help if you want to stick around after this service and help out. Just wipe down the pews, that's all you have to do. Or if you want to be contacted in the future uh, to help, there's a, there's a sign-up sheet uh, in the back of the narthex. People online, you can sign up online to help out. But Easter's coming up. I hope you know that. Easter's coming up, and we're going to need some more help with this as to keep our services and our, and our people safe that come to the congregation. But another thing that's really wonderful about this church is it has a social conscience. And part of that is being a part of a, a group called Hillsborough Organization for Hope and Equality, called HOPE, H-O-P-E. Tomorrow night, they're having their Nehemiah Project uh, gathering. It's going to be via Zoom. Uh, Hope is an a, a, a association of churches uh, along with political leaders that work toward certain issues in our society, such as affordable housing, access to medical care for those with mental illness or addiction, and criminal justice reform. This is very exciting to me to see that the church is doing it. A lot of churches talk about it, but St. Andrews is doing something about it. And if you want to, uh, if you want to sign up to be to participate in this, or just you don't want to say participate, just listen and learn. That's all you got to do. It's a Zoom call. Uh, you can sign up online for it. It's at seven o'clock tomorrow night. I think you'll really be inspired as to what this group is doing. So hope you can join us there. And the last thing, Easter is coming. The Easter egg hunt is Saturday, March twenty seventh. Uh, you can register to um, you can register to attend. They also need donations if you'd like to donate, but you can go online and register and donate. So uh, let's continue our worship again, and uh, uh, we're glad you all are here. Good morning, St. Andrews. I'm Catherine, and I'm Miss Lisa, and we're here today to talk to you about the Book of John, Chapter 15. In this book, Jesus is telling his disciples a story about the importance of staying connected to him. But before we tell you the story, we have something to show you. These are grapes, and the things that they are growing on are called vines. That's right. The vine is a really important part of producing fruit because it collects water and sunlight to help the fruit grow. So what do you think would happen if there was no vine? I think that they would die. Exactly. The vine is required for fruit to grow. So in our Bible story today, Jesus is comparing himself to a vine and us to fruit. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me, you will have much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus wants us to stay connected to him just as the fruit is connected to the vine. Uh, he doesn't mean for us to produce a lot of fruit by turning into a plant, but he wants us to produce fruit in other ways. So what are some ways that you could produce fruit if you're connected to God? I could share generosity, kindness, and loving and caring for others. That's right. That's right. Doing all of those things is a way that we produce good fruit to the people in the world around us. So your challenge this week is to go out and stay connected to God and produce good fruit for others by showing love and generosity and kindness and caring for other people. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us and always being there for us. Help us to stay connected to you so we can produce the kind of fruit that will show others your love. Give us strength to do what is right and good so we can grow closer to you. Amen. 
Yeah, and let's remember that the way that we become connected is by coming before God, recognizing his greatness, and that we need his grace. And we know that he accepts us when we do that, right? That we come before him humbly asking for forgiveness, and that he's faithful and just, and he forgives us of our sins. Uh, why don't you stand and sing this song with us? Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. In all my weaknesses, you are my confidence. Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. And I will rise. Stand redeemed, heaven open over me to your name eternally. In this glory, I will bring Jesus, I come in every broken place. You are my righteousness. Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. Sing, I will rise. And I will rise. Stand As I am, I come. Hallelujah. Oh, what amazing love. So Father, we thank you uh, for that, that when we come before you, that we're received in love, that we're not, uh, 
we're not shooed away or told that we're too bad or dismissed in shame. Those are the things that the world does, but we know that you welcome us and that you say that we're your children. We thank you for that. In your name, amen. Father, we love you. We thank you uh, that we can come before you, that we can lift you up. We thank you that you do heal us. And I pray this morning that as we prepare to hear your words, that we would uh, be focused on you and what we can learn, what we can uh, incorporate into our lives to become more like you. In your name, amen. You may be seated.
It's a good time to be a doer when your phone tells you the perfect amount of mulch. Spring can be delivered to your doorstep, and you can search for things you can't even name, then find them before you even arrive. When a quicker trip to the store means more time in the garden, and your favorite room isn't even in the house. Welcome to today's Home Depot. How doers get more done. How doers get more done. All right. How many of you love those commercials? Be honest. Do any of you anybody out there love those commercials? I see one hand. Anybody else? I mean, come on. If you're a doer, you love those commercials, right? Because you know you could do that if you chose to do that. I mean, that's what doers do, right? Now, of course, um, I would never spend the money that I would need to send to have a backyard like that, and I would never really don't even like to work in the backyard, but if I chose to work in the backyard, I'm a doer, and I could do that, right, because that's how I self-defined. Hey, Gary, can you bring me my water? I have a dry throat today. And so doers connect to that because they know how to get things done. Now, the reason I, well, actually, my sweet husband, you, you, you saw him earlier. When we first got married, I kind of learned a little bit about us from this. Um, thank you. I'm just going to leave it right here. He's a, he's a doer, right. Actually, let me tell you. So we just got married, and I remember one Saturday I said, I got this great idea. Let's go outside, and together we will wash both cars and it would be really fun. It'll save us money. Doesn't that sound good? And, and I remember looking at him, and he looked at me and said, why would I want to spend time washing the cars with you? I mean, that's, we could drive them through a car wash. And I remember thinking, because we could do it together, and he was just like, we could drive to the car wash together. And I remember thinking, who have I married? I mean, who is this man? <coughs> just had a different perspective, but the reason I like this commercial because it's kind of how I self-identify. I see myself as a person who likes to do tasks. I like to, I like to have something to show for what I accomplish. And I bring this up because often when we read scripture, we are doing just that. We self-identify ourselves in a certain way, and then we read scripture, and we read scripture through that particular lens. And sometimes we miss the message itself because we are bringing our perspective, our identity, and our culture into our reading. When we should always begin with the perspective of those first hearers of this scripture. This was spoken to a people in the first century. How did they hear the message? Why was this particular illustration picked for them? So I'm going to read our scripture to you. It's it's about a, a vineyard, and I'm going to just tell you right now that the majority of the hearers of this back in the first century were farmers, and they would have understood this illustration differently than we hear it. So let's begin with our reading today. I'm reading to us out of John 15, verses 1 through 8, and then we'll finish our scripture reading a little bit later. <clears throat> I am the true vine, and my father is the vine keeper. He removes any of the, the branches that don't produce fruit, and he trims any branches that produce fruit so that it will produce even more fruit. You are already trimmed because the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. A branch cannot produce fruit by itself but remain in the vine. Likewise, you can't produce fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches." If you remain in me and I in you, then you will produce much fruit. Without me, you can't do anything. If you don't remain in me, you will be like a branch that is thrown out and dries up. Those branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you want and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified when you produce much fruit and in this way proves that you are my disciples. All right, this is a great passage in the book of John because it reveals yet another I am statement. For the season of Lent, we have been together reading through the book of John. And so at this point, you have now heard all the different I am statements, things that Jesus said about himself to reveal to us who he is. That's one of the agendas of the book of John, revealing Jesus. And so this particular one um, told us that Jesus is the real vine. But there's been so many others. We've heard that Jesus is the bread of life. 
He is the light to the world. He is the door of the sheep. He is the good shepherd. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And now we heard Jesus is the true vine. So it's an important scripture. It helps us understand who Jesus is. And that is, that is one of our goals. Now, I don't know how much you all know about vineyards or if you've ever grown grapes. I don't know. So let me tell you a little all I, I know about a vineyard, which isn't much. When I was growing up, my um, grandparents lived in a little town called Port Huron, Michigan. They were not wealthy. They were probably more on the other end. And they lived in a big wooden house. And I remember I liked going to that because this big wooden house had a big front porch, and there was a swing on the porch, and there was even a large um, side porch. I thought it was so cool because we grew up in a ranch, and that's boring. But they had this nice square wooden house that had a really distinctive wooden smell to it. And along the side, there was this trestle, and on the trestle was a grapevine. And in the summertime, oh my gosh, that grapevine was so thick. It was just thick and twisted, and there were the amazing grapes hanging from it. It was beautiful, and, and it brought wonderful shade. I remember playing under that trestle because the shade was spectacular, and it was so beautiful. It was kind of romantic looking, and you just looked at it and thought, oh, I love that. But here was the rule. We never ate the grapes. The grapes were disgusting. They were so sour and nasty tasting, so we never um, ate them, but it it achieved its goal because for that particular grapevine, the goal was to create shade. And so that's all it needed to do. That was the goal. Well, let's talk about our vineyard here that we are referencing here. And I promise you this, that in the first century, the only goal of the vineyard would be this, making good grapes. There is no other reason in the first century to have a vineyard. You don't do it because it's pretty or because you're making your backyard look spectacular because you're a doer. No, it was only to make good grapes that could be used to make wine. That was the only reason. And all those early hearers would have known that, that um, the only reason it's there is for a particular purpose. Now, the other thing they would have known, too, is that the only way you're going to have good grapes is if the vineyard is pruned. Every vine has to be pruned. You may not have known that. So this week I kind of went to Google and started searching, like, how do you prune a vineyard? Or how do you prune just a, uh, a grape vine? And it was really interesting to hear because it turns out if you don't prune, you have no good grapes. Because what will happen is the grapes will show up everywhere, but they won't taste good. What you want is them to only show up in a particular area, offer particular shoots, and then you'll have spectacular grapes because all the nutrients will go to one place. And so how you do it is you, you wait till it's cold and the, the plant is somewhat dormant, and then you begin to, and, and a lot of times back in the ancient times, the, the vines were kind of grown on the ground, but we like to put them up higher up like on a trestle. So you attach it to a trestle, and, and then you, the idea is to, to shoot the, to, to trim off the, tri the shoots that are lower because you don't want them taking away. If you see any dead wood, you take that off. And then what you want to do is you want all the energy to go where most, the most sun is, is coming down. So you take off all the excess. And then you have hopes of a good um, grapevine and, and good grapes. Now, this is a great passage because it helps us understand this passage a little more when we think about God as the one who prunes. The scripture is actually pretty cool today because it's one of those things where they just spell out exactly everybody's job and what this, what this passage means. So it begins with telling us that God is the wine maker. His job is to assure the quality of the grapes. That's his job. And the only way, as we said, that you can um, be a good winemaker and have good grapes is to prune the wine, so that the, to prune the, the grapevine. So that is why God is the pruner. And, and when we hear that, it may kind of think about our own lives, that they use this illustration because that's often what God is doing in us. We call it, as United Methodists, sanctification. That means that when you are in relationship with Jesus, you now have moved into the stage where he is going to begin to prune you or trim off your rough edges. 
And the reason he does this is because he wants us to be fit to share the grace of God. He wants us to, to have a purpose in this world and to do it well. And so he needs to get rid of all of our rough edges that sometimes inhibits us from truly loving the world like we need to. And so he does the work because he is the wine maker. Now, Jesus is the actual vine. And that's really important to think about that. Jesus is the one who's going to make the grapes. It is through, he is the one who sources all the grapes. So it is Jesus is the only one who can, we don't make grapes. Sometimes we think that's our job to produce the fruit, but that is not our job. We are simply the conduits that the, the nutrients pass through in order for the fruit to be produced. Jesus is the source for the fruit. So that's really important to think about that. It's his job to produce the fruit. And then really the focus of this passage is us, which is we're the branches. We have a job. That we're to stay connected to the vine so that we can help produce the fruit by staying connected. Now here's the funny part, and this is the whole point about bringing up the doers. The bringing up the cultural aspects when we read something. When I say we are the focus of this passage, passage, that is correct. But what you need me to hear, hear, hear me say is while we may be the focus, we're not the end goal. You know, when we read scripture, we're always the end goal. We're thinking, oh, it's about us. It's actually not about us. It's just that our culture tends us to think that is about us. Because remember, we like to do and produce and have something to show. But it isn't about us. It's about the fruit, the fruit being produced. Hmm. So it's not about us. We're not the end goal. The fruit is the end goal. So what exactly is fruit? What do I mean by that? What do I mean by the, this good grapes? Well, there's a great verse in Galatians in chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. I'm going to read it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control against such things there is no law that is a great list of fruit that can that, that can be produced through us so how many have achieved that list right how many feel good about that yes that's me boy oh boy that's me no one's raising their hand because none of us hear that and usually feel very good about ourselves in fact that's kind of an intimidating list because while I may be doing okay on one or two of those, there's many that I'm not doing so hot. So let's look at the um, fruit a little differently. Let's call the fruit the grace of God. It's God's grace. And so God is the winemaker. Jesus is the source. And it's job, um, God's job that his grace goes into the world, that it goes out. And it's received. And when the world receives this grace, this gr sweet fruit from the, uh, from the winemaker, the world then is attracted and drawn to the winemaker. So the fruit is God's grace that goes out. Now that's a different thing to think about. So if grace is not produced... It can't go out. There's a great story in um, the book of Luke, and it's about two sisters. One day they were hosting dinner for Jesus and some of his friends. And uh, one of the sisters was a doer, and so she was in the kitchen, and she was busy doing. She was making that lunch, and she was working hard. And, you know, back then they didn't have DoorDash or takeout, and so you know she was busted at trying to get this nice meal prepared. Things like that don't fix themselves. So she's in the kitchen working, and her sister is just sitting at Jesus' feet in the front room and listening to him teach. And she's having a good old time doing absolutely nothing. And her sister is frustrated in the kitchen, and finally she's had enough. And she goes to Jesus, pulls him to the side, and says, Would you please talk to my sister? She is not helping me. I am doing this all by myself. I am carrying the load. And then Jesus comes back with this answer, and it's not the answer that any of us ever want to hear. Because he says, your sister is actually doing the better thing. Her decision to sit at my feet, that was the better choice. Now, we don't like to hear that, because if you're a doer, 
The idea of sitting in the front room at the feet of Jesus is not naturally appealing to you. You would rather be doing something as opposed to just sitting. Because that's how God made you. That's kind of how you're built. You have maybe this excess energy where you, where you can't sit well. And I think that's really important to acknowledge because that's a hard lesson to hear. Some of us, man, you got this. You're those people who get up early in the morning and you, you, you get your coffee and you sit and you read a devotion or just read your scripture and you take time to pray and you, you always make it to worship. You never miss worship. And you just, you have this ability to just connect to God on your own. It's how you're built. But that's not everybody. There's a lot of people carrying a lot of guilt around here because they don't do that so well. They don't pick up their Bible. It's hard to sit. And why would you get up early if you could sleep longer? That's just not who you are. And so you, you know you need to spend time connecting to God, but it's hard. It doesn't come naturally easy to you. And so you struggle with that. One of the reasons that Jesus is telling this story, and I think this is important to note, excuse me. This is part of a, a passage that... Um, if you've been reading along with the book of John, chapters 13 through 17 is actually a dialogue that Jesus has with his disciples. They're at this final supper that he has with them. They don't really understand what is about to happen. And so in this story, in, or in this, these, these passages, he's been teaching them. He's teaching them about what it means to wash others' feet. He's been teaching them about communion. He's been warning them about some tough stuff coming. He's even prayed for them, but he's definitely adds us some teaching, and it's in this area that he added this teaching. And the reason he's doing that, because he knows what's about to happen. The disciples are about to have their hearts broken. They're about to face the hardest disappointment of their lives. For the past three years, they have been invested in a ministry that is about to just end. They are going to be scared for their lives. And they're going to just not know what's happening. They're going to be lost. And Jesus is aware of that. And then Sunday will come and they'll regain, regain some hope. But with time again, they will go out and they'll be persecuted. And life will be hard. And, and Jesus is so aware that they need to hear these words. They need to understand that he is the vine. That they need to stay connected to him even though he isn't in front of them. And so that is a really important teaching because he understands what they're about to face. And that's really no different than any of us. Think about that. We may not be persecuted for our faith, but you know what? Our lives are crazy. We've just gone through a, a horrible, we're still in a horrible pandemic. The world is a crazy place in which we live. We had another shooting this week. We haven't seen that in a year, and we had a, a mass shooting again. The world brings us heartache and pain. And in addition to that, we are just busy people who keep moving forward. And if you're a busy person, it's really hard to connect to the vine. You're busy raising kids. You're busy doing your job. You're busy doing all the things that the world requires of you. And it's hard. It's hard to pause and pray because you're distracted. It's hard to read your Bible because we like instant gratification, and reading your Bible doesn't always make sense. It takes some work. It's hard to, to, to meditate because our minds are so busy and so distracted, and when we try to meditate, we just fail miserably. And shoot, our church attendance, it's hard to get there all the time because we're tired. The idea of ever having to come back to the sanctuary, I hear more people say, it's so nice to do this from my couch because I'm so tired from work. I get that. Because we are. We work hard. And our lives are crazy. And so thankfully, you can connect to the vine from your couch. But the reality is we all need to be worshiping. We need to be connecting to the vine. We need it. Now, before you start beating yourself up, Let's go back to our scripture and finish reading it because that's the thing about scripture. Jesus, he may challenge us sometimes, but then he reminds us so quickly how loved we are. That we don't do this alone, that we don't have to carry around this guilt. In fact, I didn't even want to preach on this passage because it, it's, it feels sort of like 
um, you know, hell and fire damnation kind of thing. And when I, I said, Gary, why did I pick this one? You know, and, and, and I, I said, you know, I just, and then I really, as I studied it, began to fall in love with it and began to recognize what it truly is saying to us. And so we have to read the second half, chapters, or excuse me, verses 9 through 17. As the Father loved me, I have loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I've said these things to you so that my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. This is my commandment. Love each other as I've loved you. No one has a greater love than to give up one's life for another's friend. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I don't call you servants any longer because servants don't know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because everything I've heard from my father I've made known to you. You didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you so that you could go and produce fruit and so that the fruit could last. And as a result, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. I give you this commandment so that you can love each other. What this reminds us is that same grace that God wants to use us to, to bring to the world will be the same grace that we will receive. We can't outgive God. Whatever goes forth through us as a conduit of God's love comes back at us. I mean, this is kind of amazing. And then we'll actually know his joy. We all need more joy. The joy of living, the joy of knowing that we have done the right thing, the joy of being of service in this world. And we'll know we are loved, and he will give us the things we need and, and desire and ask for. And then he says these crazy things, and he calls us friends. Our friend status changed. How exciting when that happens. We become his friends. That is an amazing thing to be intimate with the God of the universe. We can't outlove him. We can't outgive him. He just keeps giving back to us. So what do doers do to stay connected to the vine? If you're a doer and you, you're struggling staying connected to the vine because your life is busy or you just aren't content going in the living room and sitting at Jesus' feet, what do you do? I'm a doer. And so I have to be different than other people. You know, certain people do this so well, but that's not who I am. And I don't beat myself up for it anymore like I, I did when I was younger. So praying. I always make sure I'm doing two things at once. That's the only way it works for me to pray. I drive and pray. I shower and pray. And my big one is I walk and pray. That's when I can focus in and my brain just doesn't go in other places. If I keep my feet moving, I can keep my head and my heart focused on God. Um, meditation. Oh, this is one I desperately need. My brain is always going crazy, and it's usually not thinking good things. And so meditation is really important, but it's hard to do. It takes practice. But I keep the, blow, the bar low, and then I, I have a particular verse I use, and I have a t particular image I use. It's good to have a verse and an image. My verse comes out of um, Psalms 46. It's verse 10. And it says, be still and know that I am God. I breathe it in. I breathe it out. In my head, I'm breathing it in, and I'm breathing it out. And sometimes I just take it to be still. I breathe it in. And I breathe it out. For meditation, I, I, if you have an image that you can just focus on and keep your focus there, I use the cross at Warren Will's camp that sits out on the water and lights up at night. Um, I know I'm not alone in that. And I just focus on that cross. And I just do it for two or three minutes. But it slows down my busy brain and turns off the tapes that are constantly rolling. And it helps me find some peace. And well, worship, I'm a pastor, so I have to show up. But the rest of you, you got to figure out how to make it a priority. Talk with your family about it. Do it as a, as a group. Figure out, make a plan. How do we make this a priority when we're so busy? Reading scripture, 
Years ago, I figured out that oh, reading to scripture just put me to sleep. So I started teaching a Bible study. And I'm so afraid of humiliating myself that it keeps me reading my Bible. For the rest of you, it might just be joining a Bible study. You'll be surprised how much easier. That's why we wanted you to read through the book of John together. It's hard to read your Bible, but if you think, oh, I, I want to do that with everybody else. I'm a doer. I'm going to do this goal. That helps you get in and read. Think outside the box. But understand this. We're connecting to the vine so that we can be this conduit of God's grace, so that, so that God can have a great harvest, that the, God, the grace of God can go out into the world. And when the world tastes those grapes, when the world tastes that wine, they will say, oh, I want to meet the winemaker. It is the very thing I long for. We're just gifted and privileged that we get to be a part of the process. Just remember, you cannot give him. You will simply receive his grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, will you pray with me? Loving God, I'm so grateful to you that you have this way of infusing us with your love the fact that you would even use us to produce um, grapes is kind of insane. That you would let us be a part of the process of blessing the world. Father, it's easy to assume always that our grapes are sour, but in reality, that is your job. Help us just to be connected to you. We need you. The world needs you. Loving and merciful God, we lift up the families this week who experienced the violence of the shooting. We ask that you will surround those families with your love, that their communities will reach out to them and help them feel safe, that they will know again your love and your mercy. I thank you, Father, that you are with all of us as we walk through this pandemic, as we walk through seasons of grief and mourning, as we walk through the darkest seasons of our lives, still you are there. Father, help us to have eyes to turn to you and help us to love the communities around us so that they may see your grace. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As you hear people a lot say, uh, where have you seen God? Where have you seen God lately? Well, I have to say this church, St. Andrew's United Methodist Church, they've seen God through this whole pandemic, the last year, 2020, because it was able to maintain the ministry. Even though the church building was closed, the church was still active, active in ways that reached out to the community, active in ways that shared the message so that people can meet the one who bears the grapes, meets the grapes. And we're so thankful for that, that, that we're able to do so. And if you look in the, we may have got one of these in a mail, if you're on our mailing list. Uh, but it talks about all the wonderful ministries that continued on through the <clears throat> 2020 and what we have hopeful, hopeful in doing in the future, igniting hope. So we're very <clears throat> thankful to you all for what you've done throughout this year to keep the church ministries going. But it's, it's time now that as we're moving into the post-pandemic era, era to, to blossom to and also maintain and grow these ministries. And that takes uh, your support and your giving to do that. Um, uh, within that mailer, you'll see a little card here. And we'll ask you if you want to uh, give a, a one-time gift or regular giving. Uh, today, you can uh, either, if you're here in the sanctuary, there's baskets in the back. Uh, you can do it online. You can go to samuc.life. You can go to the church center app uh, to give, or you can even mail it in. But we thank you for your generous giving. I just ask you now to just prayerfully consider keeping the ministry of the church going so others will know who the, the one who makes the wine. Amen.
All right, well, why don't we, uh, why don't you stand and join with us as we sing this closing song. Uh, and as Jane was speaking about this morning is being part of the vine. So let's make that our, our prayer as we're singing this song that we want to be close to God. We want to be a part of that, not just, you know, a passive bystander, but we want to participate in what God is doing. Let's sing this song. Draw me close to you. Never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire one else will do Cause nothing else could take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace And help me find the way Bring me back to you all I want You're all I've ever needed You're all I want Help me know you are near Jane was speaking this morning, I was thinking, um, you know, she was describing this vine, and I thought, like, what, is, what does a vine look like? And for some reason, this just popped into my head. Maybe it means something to, uh, to you guys as well, or just serves as a good reminder. But in Galatians, Paul writes about how, he said, look, among us, there is no, and like, to let me paraphrase, he basically says, we're not finding our identity in our race. We're not finding our identity in our gender. We're not finding our identity in the things that can divide us. We're finding our identity in Christ. And what he was saying is, look, we're all brothers and sisters here. We are all equal is what we're finding out in Christ. So once again, just to reiterate, we are not who the world says we are. 
we're part of the vine. We're who God says we are. And that looks different than the world. And that means that as we go out this week, that we have to treat people like we want to be treated, right? <laughs> that means that as we go out, we have to share the love of Christ with them. And we have to see them as equal with ourselves. And we have to serve others because that is what God has done for us. And that's how we demonstrate our love for him. So let's pray as we close out this morning. Father, we love you. We thank you so much that we can be called your children, that we can be a part of your vine, of your family, and that we are new being in you. And we thank you for that. And I pray that we all have a, a good week. In your name, amen. I will thank you for joining us this morning, whether it's here or online. I pray that you do have a good week.